So I'm going to talk to you about something very different. I'm going to talk to you about science, but more to the point, I'm going to talk to you about questions. And the bigger the questions, the better. And I'd like to start with my own story. Uh, when I was a little boy, I was intensely curious, and of course that's me up there. Um, I would always ask lots and lots of questions to my mother, again, up there. And, um, you know, you've all known two-year-olds who, when, you, when, they, when they ask a question and you answer them, they say, why? You answer the question, they say, why again? And so on and so on. Well, that was me. Um, but when you do that theme of asking questions again and again and again, you get to deeper and deeper um, questions going to the more fundamental things of the universe. And if you follow that long enough, you end up with questions that ask things like, well, why is the universe the way it is? Does it have to be that way? Could it be different? How did it come into existence? And these are very, very powerful questions. And I thought I'd share a little bit about just how powerful those questions are, um, especially for me personally. I did not grow up in what you call an academic rich environment. Um, I grew up in a little town in the middle of nowhere. My mom had me way, way too young. My dad never finished high school. My graduating class was 63 kids, and it took four towns to get that many kids to come to school. It was a really small place. Um, our dinnertime conversation was not about the newest science breakthrough or Nietzsche or Kant or anything like that. Our conversations were more about things like, well, professional wrestling and NASCAR. Um, and it really was those questions that took a kid from the boondocks and brought me to where I am now, which is a researcher using one of the biggest scientific facilities ever built. Now, I'd like to get back to some of those questions because that will tell you a little bit of the journey. And I'm gonna start with this kitten. Now, I put up a kitten there because social media says, if there's a kitten, you're gonna love the talk. So, <laughs> so you realize now the onus is on you. You know, I don't have to worry. Um, so when I was young, I might have asked my mother why kittens have to have fur. And she would say, well, it's because kittens need to be warm. And then I would say, well, why do kittens need to be warm? I must have driven her totally nuts. But I'll skip a few questions along the way, but the answer, the reason why kittens need to be warm is so that their metabolism will be regular. And if you ask questions about metabolism, that inevitably leads to chemistry, and chemistry then leads to molecules. Um, and if you follow the, the rabbit hole all the way down, uh, molecular questions lead to atomic answers, and we now know that atoms are also built of smaller building blocks still, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and there's another even deeper level called quarks that you may not have heard of. We'll talk more about those in a moment. But the point is, is that when you ask deep questions, you're inevitably led to really deep things, like how the universe came to be the way it is. So I wanna tell you a little bit about what we know and then kind of branch off into what we don't know and the sort of things that my colleagues and I are working on. And to do that, I'll remind you of something you already know. Now the universe is an incredibly complex and diverse place. Um, we have me, we have you, we have the ground, we see distant stars. One of the weirdest things is we know that liquid water is actually, um, as liquid wa or water um, can be formed into ice, water, and steam three very different looking things, and yet they're all the same. And it was in the 1860s that we began to realize that all of the incredible diversity of the universe, from hummingbirds to tubas, could be made with 100 chemical elements. And that was a tremendous simplification of our understanding of the universe. Now, we now know that these elements are actually made of atoms, and the atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So now, we know that there are three building blocks of the universe, and that is absolutely incredible. Everything you see can be made by three little things, if you know the right rules. Which brings me to my next point. Knowing the building blocks is only part of the story. The next part of the story is the rules that hold things together. And we know of four fundamental forces. These four fundamental forces, two of which are familiar, two of which are less so. The most familiar is gravity, which holds us on the Earth and guides the planets through the sky. The second most familiar force is electromagnetism, which governs electricity and magnetism, but also how those lights are working and shining on me right now, and all of chemistry. There are two 
other forces that are less familiar, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, and these only have some, some impact in the center of atoms. But if you take these known forces and the building blocks of the universe, you can build the entire universe, and that's pretty cool. So, there we go. So I would like to tell you about what modern science now thinks is the ultimate building blocks. That doesn't mean that this is the final chapter in the story. In fact, it probably isn't. But this is what we know now. So oh, th this is essentially the periodic table of, of modern world. Matter is made of uh, particles called quarks. They have really dumb names. It's up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. Up and down quarks are found inside the center of protons and neutrons. And the other four exist, but only for a very short period of time. We can make them in the big accelerators, um, but they live and die in less than a millionth of a second. I'd like to uh, draw your attention to all of these because this particular, the top quark, we, I just yesterday was at a conference where we were celebrating the 20th anniversary of the discovery of the top quark. It was discovered in 1995 by, well, me. Okay. <laughs> But to be fair, it was me and 800 of my closest personal friends. <laughs> but don't tell my mom. She somehow thinks I did it myself. So these quarks are, are joined by cousin particles called leptons. The most familiar lepton is the electron. So if you take the up and down quark and the electron, you can make all of the matter that makes up you and me. These other particles you see, the uh, muon and the tau, these are cousin particles. They decay very quickly. The bottom line is a, part of a series of particles called neutrinos, which are so cool, they interact so little with matter that they can penetrate the entire Earth essentially without interacting at all. These are the matter particles. Forces are governed by additional set of particles. So here you have um, the photon, which governs electromagnetism, the gluon, which makes the strong nuclear force work and holds the center of the atom together, and the W and Z particles, which are responsible for some types of radioactivity. Um, there's a hypothetical particle called a graviton that will make, will, uh, govern how gravity works, but we don't know if that actually exists. Um, and then the final bit of this theory is this thing called the Higgs field, Higgs boson. It was discovered in, uh, on uh, Independence Day 2012, again by me. Well, <laughs> but this time it was me and 6,000 of my closest personal friends. But again, shh, don't tell my mom. So if you take all of these particles, put them together, and these forces, this is really the sum of what we know. But I'm not a person who's interested in what we know. I'm interested in what we don't know. I'm interested in the future. And so to do that, I would like to then tell you the story of the future. So currently, literally, as we speak, today, right now, under the Swiss countryside, a giant is awakening. Now, that area has hosted giants before. The nearby Jura Mountains lend their name to the Jurassic period, where we get Jurassic Park. But the giants stirring in Switzerland are not dinosaurs, but rather this, the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest particle accelerator ever built. It is 17 miles around. It is about two and a half miles across. In it, two beams of proton protons uh, go around in opposite directions at nearly the speed of light, which is fast enough to go around the Earth eight times in a single second. They collide in four points around that ring in a billion times a second, and we take photographs of the collisions. The temperature at the center of these collisions is insane. It is 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. It is 10 times hotter than the center of a supernova, which is the explosion of a star that is so dramatic and so cataclysmic that you can see it across the universe. These temperatures have not been common in the universe since the very beginning of the universe, a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. In a very literal sense, we are recreating the conditions where the universe was made and we're able to study it inside our laboratories. And that's just pretty cool. Now, in addition to being a scientific triumph, CERN is also a study in sociology because the experiments uh, that we do are not done by a single country. Scientists from, 10,000 scientists from over 100 countries come together and work on these experiments. Um, in fact, CERN itself was born 
um, right after World War II. Now, everybody knows the 1940s was not a good time for Europe. Uh, armies were running back and forth, and there was havoc everywhere. But out of the ashes of World War II, scientists suggested that perhaps there should be a pan-European uh, accelerator laboratory, and it would be built in Europe. And when the protocols were signed just a few years later, um, the people who were at the table were once enemies, Britain and France, Germany and Italy. Politics may care about borders, but science doesn't. So um, I've told you, you know, a little bit about the facility, but now I want to tell you a little bit what we're going to do with it. So the, the accelerator ran from 2010 to 2012, during which we, we wrote a thousand papers, we discovered the Higgs boson, and people often say, well, you did what you started out for, are you done? And well, that's not the, really the case, because the fact is, you know, as an analogy, if you're digging in the ground and you find a nugget of gold, you don't stop digging, you keep digging down. So the new facility, which is literally coming on, in fact, it turned on last Sunday. You could say it rose from the dead, and that was on Easter, so that's a pretty good day for that. I've heard it's been done before, though. Um, and just yesterday, they accelerated beams to the, um, to the maximum energy they have to, to, to work. And by June or so, we'll probably be colliding and taking data. Now, the, uh, this picture here is really just a metaphor to show that there is a body of human knowledge, but there's also a frontier. There is a place in human knowledge where here be dragons, and that is the place where the ship that is the LHC will be going to. Now, people will ask me occasionally, what are you going to find? And it takes all of my not very good social skills to not say, that's a spectacularly dumb question. <laughs> and the reason for that is nothing other than the LHC is a instrument of discovery. It's an instrument of exploration. It is intended to go where nobody knows the answer. So I can't tell you what we're going to find, but I can tell you what we're going to look for. We're going to try and ask questions like, for instance, are those quarks the smallest building blocks of all? Um, why are we all made of matter when our best theories say that there should be matter and antimatter in equal quantities? We're going to try and find this stuff called dark matter, which governs how galaxies rotate and, and is five times more prevalent than the matter that makes up you and me. I don't know what we're going to do. But one thing I do know is that no, no matter whatever we do, we are going to write a new chapter in the book of knowledge, a book whose first pages were penned over 2,000 years ago. And if that, if that doesn't make you just a little bit proud of your humanity and what it means simply to be human, then I don't know what will. Thank you. <laughs>